Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and today we're doing another Women of Horror Spotlight. Today I have with us, she's an author, and she has two books out right now. The first one is called Addiction Plague, as well as she also has The Haunted Zone, a horror anthology by women, military veterans. I have with us Sarah Lederos. Sarah, welcome to the Horror Room. Hey, hi, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you on, pleasure to have you on. So, tell us a Thanks. little about about, about malediction, malediction plague. Well, the malediction plague is, um, you know, it's a zombie story. But I, um, I like uh, stories that have a bit of either science or an environmental uh, aspect, uh, if I can put it in there. Um, my degree is environmental management, um, oh. but I happen to like to write horror, so oh. I I like to put those elements together whenever I can. Uh, I don't write too many of them, but when I get inspired, then I have a little fun. So that's where the malediction plague has come in. It's, uh, it wraps in a kind of a mad scientist vibe with it who um, has a huge ego. And, you know, he just kind of lets things run wild. And, and, uh, and then we wind up with a, with a zombie plague. So it was fun to write. And I love um, zombie stories where, you know, it's a it's about a virus. It's about something that, you know, I mean, with COVID, I mean, we just had a couple of years ago, it just made it real life that, you know, if right, some type right. of virus was to hit this world, what could we do? I mean, I don't think we're playing for it. Oh, we're, we're not. I mean, it's just... Um... It, it's funny how so many things could be um, twisted, you know, um, and that's the fun thing about writing horror is that you can take kind of an everyday event and uh, make something um, unusual happen, I would say. Uh, in this case, it was it was science um, and 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 just roll with it um but we have so many things that are going on in our uh, in our world right now uh, covid i mean the the state of world affairs you know politics uh you name it um everybody kind of has um uh has a heightened alert going on so it, it it's nice to kind of use that um in a way that's entertaining and writing in a way that uh, kind of lets people just kind of escape reality of everything that's going on around us for a little while. Uh, the Malediction Plague's a novella, uh, novella, so it's not a long read. It's about 100 pages or so, 110. Um, but uh, it's, it's very easy for us to kind of go off the rails, um, and, and sometimes fiction can mirror reality. You know, we have people working in in research labs and and doing things you know who knows what yeah. <laughs> um and this the story is just one instance of where um he's uh his fiance breaks up with him because she realizes that he's he's just really not a good guy um and so um you know it starts off with his fiance and him and then it kind of ends the prologue or the uh, epilogue is uh you know goes back to her uh a little bit so something could develop after this story uh, i don't have anything planned but it might pop up down the road uh but it's just one example um in a fun way of of somebody who um gets a little twisted up in their head you know from their their history and their where their family comes from and um there are some content warnings because he's he's a little yeah, he's got a little ego and superiority complex, and, and there's some political um, hot topics, I guess, that are touched on in this book. So so how long did it take you to come up with this story? Uh, well, it was actually a little bit based on a short story that I wrote ages ago um, and was published um, back in 2010, and I always, I had kind of wanted to expand on it um, uh, or play on it, you know, a little more with uh, the characters who they really were and, and delve into the uh, mindset of where uh, something like that can come from. So, you know, 
hurt people hurt people. You know, if you if you get that people that are damaged um, and haven't figured out how to heal themselves, manage to either buy um, on purpose or because they have not learned how to do things better for themselves, you know, coping mechanisms or learning where they come from, um, they wind up hurting other people. So that is kind of where this guy comes from. He's uh, German descent. So of course his grandfather was, you know, on, on the Nazi side in World War II. So he has these, um, these, mind games going on in his head of the voices of his father and his grandfather as he's uh, working in his lab and um, it brings him to this you know he's just got a kind of an ego thing going because he's a smart guy and he and he thinks that he can solve you know one of world's problem you know world problems that he's focused on you know he's hyper fixated on on population um, but you know, in, in doing that and, and not having anybody else checking him, you know, yeah. stopping him from, from doing, continuing his work, he winds up um, just, you know, going with this mad idea, which I won't get into much, um, that, that sets things off and just really um, kind of snowballs the whole um, virus out into his, uh, into his city. Sarah, uh, your opinion, why do you think hurt people get into relationships? I mean, it's, it's, it's a wacky idea, but why do you think they always seem to get into relationships? Well, everybody gets into relationships. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about people who are mostly damaged or they, 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 uh, they have traumas with them. What oh, is sure. your opinion? They usually uh, seem to get comfort from relationship. And we were talking about hurt people are hurt. They and and a lot of times because they haven't fixed themselves, they usually wind up hurting the person who they're with. Well, right, right. I mean, as you've said, uh, I, I think. I like to tell people, especially those that are um, kind of going through something and it's, and it's kind of hard to, um, to relate or, or to get them to kind of um, come out of their, their issue at the moment is that there's no normal, you know, every, we think that everybody's normal, but everybody has something going on in their lives or, or have had a trauma or a, a difficult experience that um, affects who they are and how they are, um, dealing with other people, dealing with themselves. So if they haven't, if they haven't dealt with the issues that, you know, either growing up or traumatic event, sexual abuse, you know, whatever the case may be, if, if they've not figured out how to, um, to cope with what's happened to them, the emotions that get entangled with that, um, how to either, you know, if they consider um, themselves to blame for whatever odd reason, you know, nobody's, um, you know, especially in the cases of sexual assault or abuse or those type of things, um, they, a lot of times, especially if you're growing up as a child and you've been abused, you, you're conditioned. You know, there's a long time that probably goes through that you think that this is normal everybody's you know everybody's got parents that are awful or, or whatever you don't you don't see um that there's another way until you are probably out into the world a little bit maybe in your middle school high school when you start to branch out and get a little more independence and you understand that wow what i'm growing up with or what i'm i've been dealing with is not normal and this is you know there are people out there that can help me there are people out there that maybe i can tell what's actually happening um you know all of those type of things so um i mean getting into relationships is inevitable i mean we all it's part of being human is to to have relationships um but i think that hurt people people who are hurt hurt others because they've not learned how to um deal with what's happened in their past or or they're emotionally immature i mean there are a bunch of different reasons yeah. that could be um you know behind their behavior um 
So, I mean, it's a very complicated thing, but I, I think deep down it's hurt people, hurt others because they've not, they've not dealt with their, um, their own trauma or their own issues so that there's, there's something that they they just need to either learn or come to grips with the feelings that they have with it or face their, the, you know, somebody who's, who's hurt them in the past and, and gain back some of their power. Um, could be a lot of different things, but, um, you know, that's simplifying it is that hurt people hurt others because they've yes. really not dealt with their own, their own issues. I totally agree. Now, I hope after, that answered your question. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, 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 was, that was a good answer. Now, as an author, when you're writing and you're developing characters, do you ever use individuals from real life experiences? Someone you may know, someone you've seen at a coffee shop. A form of balls. Do you ever kind of put wow. them in your stories? Oh yes, of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I somebody else asked me about my a boss. I, I guess I have to do that at some point. But no, I haven't put a boss in in a story. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll pick different you know personalities out of out of some folks, good and bad or whatever. You know, just thinking of. of um, Oh, you know what so and so did would work well in this spot, or, or, um, you know, somebody really I just really don't like them, and you know, so I I might have to kill them off, or you know, they 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 get a beating from somebody, you know, whatever. But they, you know, so they might, you know, reality inspires fiction, you know, and so it's the other way around, you know, um, fiction sometimes can re uh, inspire reality, but. Um, yeah, of course. I think I think almost all writers um, pull pull a lot from their from their daily lives or whatever. And I pull names from we we uh, go to uh, baseball games a lot. And um, if I, you know, because you'll you'll get names of people you know that are playing or whatever from all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh, that's a good that's a good name, you know. And I'll jot down on my notes on my phone a, a name of somebody, you know. And, um, but yeah, uh, other people that I know in real life, obviously, obviously their their characteristics or or their job or just depends, you know, um, could could wind up in a story. I won't put hey, their names with yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you ever had someone in your life read one of your books and be like, "Sarah, this character seems a lot like me." Um. Hmm. No, I don't think so. I mean, I haven't written that much, so you know, I, I haven't gotten to that point yet. But um, yeah, I don't. Mm, I don't think so. No, no, not yet. I mean, it might come up some point, but not not right now. <laughs> right. And, and you also have a second book out right now. It's an anthology. It's called The Haunted Zone. So tell us a little bit about The Haunted Correct. Zone. Correct. Correct. Well, that was inspired from um, the Horror Writers Association does a um, an event in November that highlights uh, horror writers who are veterans. You know, the, uh, they call it the um, Veterans in Horror Spotlight. So I was interviewed back in 2022 in November, and one of the questions that was asked is you know, throughout the whole thing towards the end, you know, is what other... Um, you know, who, who else is a veteran who's writing horror that you can recommend to, you know, uh, others? And so I immediately could think of several um, men who were horror writers who were, who were military veterans, but uh, I couldn't think of a woman. So that, that irked me. Now, I've been out of writing for a while. There's a big, big gap of probably 10 or 12 years. I had several short stories done in 2010, 2011, and then... Uh, because my job, you know, my day job, um, I was, uh, I didn't write for quite a long time, various reasons, you know, just a lot going on. <clears throat> so part of it was me that I just didn't know who was, you know, who was writing right now that was, um, that, that was a woman vet. But also it just, um, when I started doing a little research, I realized that uh, there are not very many of us. And, uh that there had been previous uh, anthologies that have, somebody had tried to put together, three or four different publishers over, I think I went back five or six years. 
and none of those publications made it to fruition. None of them actually got published. So I don't know if they didn't have enough uh, participation uh, or what the case was, but that, that bit of research really kind of solidified my, my desire to make sure that other women's uh, voices were heard in the horror community that were, um, that were military veterans. And so um, by that point, since my research and of course the interviews through um, that Veterans and Horror Spotlight, uh, I met a few other women uh, veterans that were writing horror that I invited then to uh, write for this anthology. Uh, and then I put an open call out because I really wanted this to uh, get out there and to highlight who we are, what segment we are of the community, because we are a very small portion um, of the horror community that's out there. And then also to make it full circle, uh, it's a charity anthology, so it supports uh, the National Veterans Foundation. Um, and I really liked that uh, Shad Mashad, the founder of uh, the National Veterans Foundation, he's been working with women uh, in the military and their trauma and their issues since the Vietnam War. So he was, he was a psych officer and uh, he dealt with the nurses that were um, treating um, combat, you know, wounded and stuff. And yet the service did not recognize the nurses as having um, any trauma or PTSD or anything because they were not in combat themselves. So you can imagine though, they're, they're dealing with um, death um, all kinds of physical ailments, uh, obviously wounded coming back with, um, you know, trauma issues, mental issues, physical issues, whatever. Yet these women could not find any way uh, to seek uh, even an outlet or somebody to listen to them or whatever. So they started small groups back then. And I just liked that he has committed pretty much his entire life since then to um, helping veterans, helping women veterans. Um, so uh, that is the charity that is being supported and their women veterans programs um, through the sale of the horror anthology. Um, so it kind of goes for full circle. We have um, everybody that was involved in our Haunted Zone project was a woman veteran. Uh, we even have one who's from Australia. She was in the Australian army. Wow. Uh, most of the, most of us are are uh, U.S. Uh, veterans, but uh, everybody. Our cover artist, she was a, a veteran. Our interior illustrator, um, Elise McKelvey, can't say enough. First time she touched horror, but she knocked it out of the ballpark. Um, she was a combat artist in the Marine Corps. Um, she still does a lot of military-related um, artwork uh, that is phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to to look up her stuff. Um, so it was a passion project, but it turned out great. Uh, we wound up with 21 authors, um, 19 short stories, uh, seven poems, uh, fresh new voices in horror, as well as some veterans that I just didn't know about before. But we get to yeah. we get to bring them all out to everybody so that they get to read them. That's really good. That's amazing. I had um, Thank Pamela, you. and I'm having a brain freeze. What her last name is? Um, Pamela. Pamela Kinney, yes, yes. Kinney, yes, I had on my show, and um, right, I, I believe she's a part of the anthology as well. She is, yes. She um, provided a story called Haunted App, and then she also has a poem in um, Ghosts of Written Words. I think is the title of her poem there too. Yes, so she submitted too um, in that, and then we have quite a few others. Um, we've been doing. Uh, bookstores and, and um, events since the release, but we have quite a few here in Virginia, so we've been able to gather probably uh, five or six at each event. Um, but Pamela's been around for, for a bit. She was actually one yeah. of the first ladies that I reached out to because um, we're in the same uh, Virginia chapter of the Horror Writers Association, and uh, yeah, she was great with uh, helping connect me with some others as well. It's amazing, and I so I, I mean, throughout my life, you know, always going from my mother to, you know, I have a lot of women in my life who were military veterans. So I definitely have a found respect for women, well, veterans in general, but especially women veterans. I mean, especially, you know, like you were talking about, my mom was a VA nurse, you know, during the Vietnam War. So she got to see a lot of that, 
for Maddox, though. Oh, wow. And, like, yeah, so oh. a lot of, you know, so, but like you're saying, attention hasn't been brought on that, that, you know, that even back then. Oh, um, right. So I, I would just say that uh, along with that, too, so it's it, it didn't get a lot of notice uh, in the past, but um, one thing that has really um, been an interesting, uh, unfortunate find in the past few years is that uh, women veteran or active duty are now women are combatants. So they're actually going to combat. They're actually in, in higher risk roles. Um, but they're also, we all expect women to be nurturers, to, to be home on the home front, taking care, care of the kids and, you know, being the center of the uh, kind of the heart of the family, if you will. So there is a, a bit more stress, I would say, um, these days with women in the military with their roles there. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing that. I think women should should and can be doing everything that a man's doing. Um, but uh, with that, um, that added bit of, I think, being the nurturers at home, children, you know, those type of things, there, there's a bit more going on uh, than what we've had going uh, in the past. And so homelessness in women uh, veterans has been steadily on the rise wow. so uh that is yet a new issue that i don't think uh i mean we've probably had it always had in the past but it's um it's increasing um at a pretty good clip that we you know would really like to not continue you know we want to make sure that that everybody uh especially our veterans um you know are not sleeping on the streets and and that their their issues are being addressed now. So the National Veterans Foundation has a 24-7 hotline. You know, people can call in any time, day or night. They've got somebody manning phones. So um, yet again, just one reason why uh, we picked them to be the, um, you know, the participants that we could send the funds to um, based on, you know, the sales of this anthology. I love it. I will be grabbing a copy of the support as well. So Oh, said. thank you so much. I appreciate that. I support all of our servicemen and women. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Doing. Much appreciated. Now, and I do have a question. Have you always been a horror fan? Oh, always, always. I remember back in Ohio, and I'm not going to remember the name of the show, but you know, all of the the diehard horror fans who, um, you know, remember names, and you know, they've they've read folks forever and ever, but. Uh, there used to be a show Friday night, um, Chuck and Houlihan or something like that. I grew up in Ohio. Um, used to be on Friday nights, I think, or, or Saturday in the evenings. I can't remember. But, um, yeah, I used to love it. You know, it, it was, uh, it was uh, a nice break, I guess, from reality. So I was the youngest of seven and the only girl. So, and, and wow. I was the only one that went. The only one that went in the Marine Corps, so you know that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really what that means, but um, no, it was just fun. I mean, I we lived out in the middle of nowhere. We did not. We, we were definitely on the poor side, so um, you know, entertainment was um, you know finding a good show, and I just enjoyed watching those. Um, I think if it was Friday night, it was probably after the the local football team that or my brothers were playing football, and then you know go home and then watch you know watch a crazy movie or whatever. But um, yeah, always. And I I mean I grew up reading Anne Rice and Clive Barker and um, you know um, Shirley Jackson, you know uh, Edgar Allan Poe, a lot of classic kind of stuff too. But uh, I didn't even think about writing horror until I was, you know, my kids were getting getting older and, and I got back together with, you know, then it was online writing groups, you know, people were just starting to kind of form these things or, or they'd been around and I had just discovered them because I'm almost <laughs> always late to the game. Uh, Me too. But, Me too. Uh, yeah, it was fun. A great, great group of, of folks from probably all around the world. We had three or 400 people, I think, in, in that writing group. Um, and we split it all up into different genres. You know, we had poetry and we had horror and romance and paranormal, paranormal kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And um, I, I like crime thrillers too. I haven't written one yet, but I do have a draft that, oh, excuse me, I'm working on. Um, so I just like the darker kind of stuff. Um, 
not really into writing romance or or cozy yeah. cozy mysteries. Although I have a family member who she wants me to write write a cozy, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's going to happen. But yeah, it's um, yeah, I like the scare factor or whatever. You know, something a little different. Not too extreme. I'm not into extreme horror, but um, yeah, I just like writing. Uh, I think horror has the ability to touch on probably every emotion. It really does. You know, so when you go into horror, you you don't really, I mean, you know, there's going to be a scare factor, but it can kind of go every anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're in a, you know, you pick up a romance, you know what you're going to get in a romance novel. You know, you pick up, um, you know, a cozy mystery. You just know that it's not going to be, you know, it's, it's just going to be a feel good kind of fun thing. Um, but horror is the genre. I think that you can, um, you can go anywhere with it. You really can. Um, I mean, there are so many subgenres to horror yes. that um, you you can you can hit every kind of thing. Like I said, I I'm not an extreme horror fan whatsoever. I've picked up a book here or there that I was not expecting it to be what it was, and um, can't, couldn't tell you now if I I finished. Uh, I used to always try to finish a book, and I'm too old for that now. So. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, totally yeah, I like agree those stories. I'm sorry? Yeah, but I totally agree with you. A, a lot of people say they don't like horror, but I'm like, that's a broad statement to make because there's so many subcategories in horror. You probably just haven't found the right thing. Well, and honestly, I think a lot of um, mainstream genres are horror. You know, I think mm -hmm. crime and, and mystery thrillers or whatever, they're horror. You know, you're you're touching on those, those emotions and connecting with the readers or viewers, you know, if it's a film, uh, that, that makes them hesitate or get, makes them scared, makes them fearful, you know, whatever. Um, when you're reading a crime thriller, you, that's a horror novel. They, they're just not going to call it that because for some reason the word horror, you know, just um, gets a bad rap. Taboo, yeah. Um, but but there are a lot of mainstream that that to me would be horror. I agree, like because because I did I did a um, what well, um I did a live video last week with the author, oh. and her her and I we were doing a comparison between the talented Mr. Ripley, which was a movie that was um that was out in 1999, and also the new one Saltburn, and like a lot of horror creators were saying those movies are not horror movies. Those, Travis, you're full of it. That's not hard movies, but they make you hmm. stop and think, and and they brought out that natural primal fear of like what is going to happen, and sure. and any movie that does that is a horror movie. Like you don't need blood and guts and people's heads getting. Oh right, one of my favorite things is psychological horror. horror. Yes, like right. and I don't know why, but a lot, a lot of horror. Even like filmmakers, they, they um, which I'm shocked that even horror authors, um, and fans, they think that in order for a movie to be horror, you have to have blood and guts and slashing and dashing. No. But no, uh, something no, that's no, I'm horror, not into slasher. See that it's horror, yeah. but I don't want to see that. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not a um, you know, uh, the Saw series. I think I saw the first one. I was like, mm, I'm not going to be watching the rest of those. You know, there are just certain things that aren't. Um, I, I, blood and blood and guts uh, are a part of it. I mean, the Malediction Plague has some gore in there. I mean, it's a zombie uh, no, mm -hmm. novella, of course. It's going to have um, you know things getting ripped out or whatever. But that's not the heart of it. Um, my writing tends to have a um, kind of a a look at humanity in a way. Either it's got a moral kind of compass to it, where somebody gets their due. Um, or um, it touches on a, 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 a little bit of a higher plane, I guess. I don't want to really say that because um, I don't know if my writing's higher plane. But, <laughs> um, but just uh, slashers or whatever. I mean, they're for fun entertainment, but I, I, some of them I, I wouldn't do. I can do a screen movie, but I, don't, I can't watch Saw, you know, yeah. 5 or 10 or whatever they're up to now at this point. Um, but everybody's brand of horror, what's what's going to strike them is going to be different. That's that's what's fun about it is that it really um, there's 
there's something for everyone. Um, as long as people don't get hung up, if they're hung up on the word horror, or that horror is a genre, you know, that, you know, just forget about that. But, um, you know, see, there's something out there for everybody. There really is. There really is. All right, Sarah, wh where can everyone find you? So I'm um, <clears throat> social media wise. I'm 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 everywhere but nowhere. Um, I don't I don't post that much on social media. Mostly on Instagram, Facebook. Um, website is my name. Um, I also run Tundra Swan Press that that um, did uh, the Haunted Zone. So uh, a couple of websites there. But the books are out everywhere. They're on Amazon. Um, if you order from uh, my website for the haunted zone, then I, I get to send a higher percentage um, of profit over to uh, the National Veterans Foundation uh, rather than if you buy through Amazon or whatever. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I'm everywhere, but I, I really just kind of post on Instagram and uh, Facebook, LinkedIn actually, because you know, the, it's a military related uh, anthology. So uh, I probably had more contacts on LinkedIn than I did anywhere else. But um, nice. yeah, I'm, I'm kind of everywhere. But if people want to reach out for any reason, you know, they can hit me up through the contact page or, or through social media and, and I'll, you know, I'll answer anything that I can for them. Awesome. Well, the link to the website will be down in the description box. So please click on it okay. and grab the copy of these two books. Sarah, Thank it's been an so absolute much. blast. You are, it's been an absolute blast having you on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Love to do it again sometime. Thank Listen, you. You're more than welcome. I would love to have, uh, actually, I would love to have a show where I've had all military women, uh, veteran car writers on, and we can just talk. That would be fun. Nice. Well, we can probably set that up. There's several of them in the haunted zone, so we can... Um, Yes. Yeah, we can start there and, and expand, you know, if you wanted to. But uh, there are 21 of us in that. So uh, that's a good place to start. I don't know if you can fit any more than that on a screen at one time. But. No, I can't. But <laughs> we, can start with, we can start with five and then do. Oh, there we go. Yes, that's work, easy. Yeah. I, could, I yes. could get those together. We'll yeah. have to do this again for that. <laughs> Most definitely. Most definitely. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the Horror Round. I'm Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.